In video 30 of Tensor Calculus, we'll continue our in-depth analysis of the Christoffel symbol. In particular, we'll derive a formula that lets us evaluate the Christoffel symbols for any coordinate system. For the past few videos, we've been analyzing the Christoffel symbol. Well, today we want to answer the question, how do you evaluate these things? Well, one way to do that is to simply appeal to their basic definitions as you see them here. For example, if we wanted to find the Christoffel symbol of the first kind, 221, then we'd need, first of all, to have uh, the covariant basis vector, Z2, and we'd need to find the dot product of that with its partial derivative with respect to Z1. So we need to dot Z2 with the partial of Z2 with respect to Z1. Now all we're doing here is just uh, mapping out the individual index values as per the formula. Okay, well, um, let's take a look at what this would be in plane polar coordinates. You go back to video number 12, you'll see that this is the value for covariant basis vector Z2. Well, what we need now is its partial derivative with respect to Z1. So the partial of Z2 with respect to Z1, well, in plane polar coordinates, Z1 is just R, so we're finding the partial derivative of this with respect to R, and that's minus sine theta x hat plus cosine theta y hat. So all that's left is to find the dot product between these two, and that's easy. You multiply the first two factors together and the second two factors together and, and add them together. So um, gamma 2, 2, 1 here is going to be negative r sine theta times negative sine theta. That's just r times sine squared theta. And then r cosine th theta times cosine theta is r times cosine squared theta. And you've seen this sort of thing many times before. Factor out the r. What's left is sine squared plus cosine squared, which is 1. So the whole thing evaluates to r. Okay, well, uh, one comment here. These Christoffel symbols will always be a function of the individual coordinate values. So in plane polar coordinates, all the Christoffel symbols should be functions of r and theta. And that's certainly true here. Um, this Christoffel symbol is simply equal to the value of r. Well, this technique works just fine, but it can prove to be a little bit uh, tedious. Um, you know, the indexes can have values of 1 or 2, which means that there are going to be 8 different uh, Christoffel symbols of the first kind and 8 Christoffel symbols of the second kind. And in each case, we're going to have to get the covariant basis vector, find its partial derivative, find the dot product, and um, we're going to have to do that 16 times. As I say, it works, but it's a little tedious. As it turns out, there's a, another formula that's much more convenient and easier to work with. So let's go see what that looks like. We're going to start by finding the partial derivative of our covariant metric tensor. And to do that, we're going to fall back on the definition of our covariant metric tensor, which of course is just the uh, set of dot products of our covariant basis vectors, zi and zj. Okay, so what's in the parentheses is our definition for the covariant metric tensor. Well, of course, to carry this out, we're going to need the product rule. Now, if you were paying attention in the last video, you'll see this as the definition of the Christoffel symbol of the first kind. Well, this one is too. Remember, the dot product is commutative, so we could put this term first, and therefore they both have the same form. Therefore, our result, the partial derivative of zij with respect to zk, is simply equal to gamma jik plus gamma ijk. 
All right, now this is a very important result in its own right, but it leads to what I think is one of the coolest derivations in all of tensor calculus, because it showcases the power and utility of the syntax. What we're going to do now is to permute the indexes. And by permute them, I mean this. We're going to rename i to k, and we're going to rename k to j, and we're going to rename j to i. So we're going to rename them in a cyclical fashion like this. And any time we do this, it's known as permuting the indexes. OK, the way I like to do it is to write the expressions out without the indexes, just to put all the letters in, but no indexes yet. And we'll fill in the indexes in just a minute. So these are both gamma symbols, like this. OK, so i is going to become k. So k is going to go in this position. And it's going to go in the middle position here and the first position here. And then k is going to become j. So this will be j. This will be j. And this will be j on the end. And then j becomes i. So j is i here. And j is i here. And j becomes i here. OK. And we're going to do it one more time. We're going to permute the indexes. So it's the partial of z with respect to z. And again, the two gamma symbols here, this one and this one. So i becomes k. So k is here, here, and in the middle on this one. And then k becomes j, which means j is here, here, and here. And then uh, j becomes i. So this is i down here, i here, and i on the end. So we have permuted the indexes twice to form three separate equations. OK, now what we're going to do is we're going to add this equation to this equation, and then we're going to subtract this one. So add this one, add this one, and subtract this one. Now on the right-hand side, compare this term to this one. Remember that the last two indexes are symmetric. So we can flip these two indexes. And when we do that, these two terms are exactly the same. Well, we're adding this one. We're subtracting that one. So the net result is that these two terms cancel each other out. All right. Now something similar happens when we compare um, this term right here to this one. Notice again that we can flip these indexes. And when we do, this term equals that one. We're adding this. We're subtracting that. So once again, the result is that these two will cancel each other out. And finally, if you look at these two guys, this one and this one, once again, the terms are equal. We can flip these indexes so these two are the same. However, we're adding these two so they don't cancel each other out, but they double up. In other words, what we're left with here is 2 of gamma ijk, because these are the same. They add together to give us 2 of them. All right, so all that's left now is to multiply it through by 1 half and flip sides of the equation. What this gives us is an explicit formula for the Christoffel symbol of the first kind in terms of the partial derivatives of the covariate metric tensor. We don't need the uh, basis vectors. We don't need any dot products. It's simply the partial derivatives of the covariate metric tensor combined in this way to give us the value of the Christoffel symbol of the first kind. Well, to see how this works, let's redo the problem we did earlier in the video. We're looking to find the Christoffel symbol 221 for plane polar coordinates. Remember last time we
plug these values into the definition for the Christoffel symbol of the first kind and just work through that. Well, here we're going to use this formula. So it's going to be one half of the partial of z2, 2 with respect to z1 plus the partial of z1, 2 with respect to z2 minus the partial of z2, 1 with respect to z2 like this. Okay, well, the beauty of this particular method is that all we need is the covariant metric tensor. And for plane polar coordinates, that's what we have right here. So, using these values, we find that uh, gamma 2, 2, 1 is going to be equal to 1 half the partial of 2, 2 with respect to Z1, which is R. Well, that's this term, the partial of this term with respect to R, and that's just 2R. And then the partial of Z1, 2 with respect to Z2, well, 1, 2 is 0, so this term is 0. And over here, Z2, 1 is 0, so this is minus 0, and obviously, this evaluates out simply to the value of R. So we get the same result with this formula that we got earlier in the video. But all we had to, to, to use was the covariant metric tensor and plug it into this one formula. And that's what makes it so much nicer than the other method. Well, what about the Christoffel symbol of the second kind? Well, that's easy. All we've got to do is to raise this I index. So to do that, we'll rename I to M first of all, and then we'll contract both sides with the contravariant metric tensor ZIM. Of course, this expression right here converts to the Christoffel symbol of the second kind, and that gives us what we're looking for. What we have is an explicit formula for the Christoffel symbol of the second kind. All we have to do is to plug in the appropriate values for the covariant metric tensor and the contravariant metric tensor. Okay, with that, let's stop and do a recap of what we've accomplished in this video. The first thing we did was to derive this relationship. Now, this is based upon the definition of our covariant metric tensor, along with the definition of the Christoffel symbol of the first kind that we derived in the previous videos. Now, this um, relationship is important in its own right, and we're going to use it several times in future videos. But in this particular video, we showed how to permute the indexes twice and use the result to derive this explicit formula for the Christoffel symbol of the first kind. And uh, the importance of this relationship is that this is an explicit formula for the Christoffel symbol of the first kind that's based strictly upon the covariant metric tensor. That's all we need in this formula to derive the values for all of the possible Christoffel symbols of the first kind. Well, we then went on to show that we could do something similar for the Christoffel symbol of the second kind simply by raising the I index here. And we do that by contracting this contravariant metric tensor with the expression for the Christoffel symbol of the first kind. So in both cases, we have explicit formulas for the Christoffel symbols. And the beauty of these uh, relationships is that all we need in order to carry out the calculation is the metric tensor, the covariant metric tensor and the contravariant metric tensor. We don't need basis vectors. We don't need any dot products or anything like that. So it makes it a very simple and straightforward calculation to um, evaluate the Christoffel symbols for any given coordinate system. Now, as a practical matter, I find it's easier to work your way through all of the Christoffel symbols of the first kind and simply take those values and raise the indexes of them one by one to get this result. And that's exactly what we're going to do in the next video, 
as we go through each of the sample coordinate systems and evaluate the Christoffel symbols.